I recently came across a clip on Twitter of James White offering a critical response to Mike Licona. And it's just the kind of thing that I felt I needed to respond to here on my uh, modest little YouTube channel. So what I'm gonna do is begin by showing the clip itself, and uh, then I'm gonna offer some commentary on it. So this clip is posted on a web uh, channel on YouTube called Muslim by Choice. Uh, and I'll just play the clip, uh, which shows Mike Licona and then shows James White offering a critical response to Mike Licona. You know, one time he asked me uh, uh, several years ago, I was telling him about doubts and he said, well, how sure are you Christianity is true? I said, well, about 80%, 80%, you know, and it's like, uh, he just couldn't, he got mad at me for that. And it just stewed in him for several years. We didn't talk about it for a few, several years, but we invited him to visit us in the Atlanta area for Christmas. And they originally agreed and then he canceled it because he was so upset that a few years before that, I'd said I was only 80% certain Christianity was true. Um, and so when you, if, if you approach it from that perspective, and most people are approaching it from that perspective, that, that's the only way you can put a number on something. Is that you're saying, well, you know, I'm assigning a, a certain value. And, you know, from what I've seen, I'm 80%, 85% convinced. Now, I think that there is on a pastoral level, a really good reason for apologetics to be done within the church, because I would simply say from a pastoral perspective that if you're only 85% sure, you probably shouldn't be involved with apologetics. Just that I can't see how that's your calling. If, if, if that, if that's where you are, I don't get that. And you see, if, if, if apologetics was done in the church, and especially done by elders who are to be gifted to have the ability to do the things they've been called to do, um, then that's totally different than how we handle these things where, again, most apologists just do whatever they want to do. And they go wherever they want to go. They're not really ministers in the church, associated with the church. That's one of the major problems. Okay. So let's have a little conversation. So James White says... Uh, uh, that people shouldn't be doing apologetics if they're 80% or 85% sure that Christianity is true. Uh, he doesn't say what percent is expected, but the pretty clear implication of the video is that 100% is what you would expect from somebody doing apologetics. In other words, they're 100% certain there is no doubt at all that they are certain in the truth of Christianity as they are certain that they exist or that two plus two equals four that that kind of absolute certain conviction is what is required, apparently, in James White's view, for people to do apologetics. He also throws in there that he thinks it should be done by elders in the church, by which we can say that means male elders should be teaching apologetics. I'm going to leave apart that, uh, that particular issue and just focus on what he says here about, by implication, certainty being the expectation. First of all, it's extraordinary that he says this in direct response to Mike Licona. Uh, Mike Licona, in terms of character, is, I think, without a doubt, one of the absolute nicest people that you can find in Christian apologetics, right up there with Paul Copan. Um, one of the very nicest people that I've met in apologetics. He's a wonderful, very gentle, kind, funny, engaging person. So uh, I think it is essential to recognize that character is a big piece of your apologetic. and. Mike Licona has that in spades. Second is content. Well, what is Mike Licona doing in his apologetics? Well, I mean, I think, uh, of course, the thing he's most well known for um, is his historical defense of the resurrection of Jesus and also his critical analysis of the Gospels um, as genre of, of literature and their historical veracity and how to understand and interpret them. And I think that, again, Mike Licona is at the top of his game there. He's done outstanding, wonderful service um, in his written work, in his debates, both in his popular and academic work, in his popular speeches and his debates. So character and content, I think he knocks that out of the park. But he says he's only 80% sure that Christianity is true, and that alone 
is enough uh, for James White to say he shouldn't be doing apologetics, really. It doesn't matter what his character and the content of his apologetic work is. Um, if you're not certain, then you shouldn't be doing apologetics. Much better to have an elder lay person, who, lay man, who is certain uh, be teaching in the local church than have Mike Lacona doing it. I mean, I think that that's just a kind of a very bizarre thing to say. Uh, but let me just make four specific points by way of critical response. The first thing is that this emphasis upon psychological certainty, and I guess somehow linked to epistemic certainty that you could not be wrong. I mean, it's not clear whether uh, James White is talking only about psychological certitude being without a doubt or believing that you, you or actually having an indefeasible belief, one that about which you could not be wrong. Either way, it seems to me that pretty clearly what is happening here, the first point, is it's, a, it's an over-realized eschatology. You know, what I mean by that is that White is assuming as normative in the present age, certain states of being which will only fully obtain in the age to come. Now, interestingly, another example where you see this kind of over-realized eschatology is in prosperity preachers who say that if you are truly following God and submitted to his will and exercising faith in your life, then you should have no physical illness or material want. You should, in fact, be monetarily wealthy and also physically healthy. And if you are not, it is because you are failing to exercise the faith that God gives to you. Uh, now, I think that that is clearly wrong. That's not only wrong, but it's deeply toxic, that kind of prosperity preaching. Because in fact, at the heart of Christianity is the concept of taking up your cross daily and following Jesus. Or in the case of Paul, of having a thorn in the flesh uh, through which Christ um, makes you strong in him rather than in the removal of the thorn. Um, so in other words, the Christian life is about suffering and it's about denial and about want and learning to be dependent upon God in the midst of that. And that is not only the case when it comes to material goods and physical wellness, as the prosperity preachers focus on, but also in terms of psychological certitude or epistemic certainty. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, as one example, says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So what Paul is saying is, here is there's a contrast between two ages, the present age and the age to come. In the present age, we lack all sorts of knowledge that we wish we have, but we see darkly as through a glass then we shall see face to face, but not now. And for James White to require that Christian disciples must have some kind of psychological certitude or epistemic certainty equivalent to the beatific vision in the present age is an over-realized eschatology. For many people, doubts and questioning, uncertainty are an ineradicable part of their Christian journey. And to say that those people cannot should not uh, be engaging in apologetics is no less flawed than thinking that a person who struggles with physical wellness or material wealth should not be preaching. I mean, they're both just ridiculous assertions and they're based on a toxic understanding of overrealized eschatology. Second thing uh, I want to note is that certainty in fact, can often close the door to conversation, whereas doubts can open the door to conversation. If a person is certain about things, then what can often happen is that when they talk to other people and they share their certainty and their total lack of any doubt with that other person, it comes across not as a sign of strength or an invitation, but hey, I wanna know more about this, it can repel. It can seem like, oh, this guy thinks he's already got it figured out. Why would I want to talk to him anymore? Because you see, most people are interested in conversations because they view those conversations as a two-way street, as an exchange, a back and forth. Yes, I can possibly learn from you, but you can learn from me too. But if you come into the conversation saying, I'm certain, I have no doubts about the wrongness of my position, or I should say the rightness of my position, um, I'm certain about all the major commitments of my worldview, 
Well, that is just going to come across to the other person as making you sound like a dogmatic and perhaps unreflective ideologue, and they're less likely to want to talk to you. And certainly the first step of apologetics is to win over an audience, someone who is willing to and interested in listening to you. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not following it falling into the trap of James White by saying, so people who are certain shouldn't be doing apologetics, not at all. Um, in fact, um, I would welcome them as much as anybody, but I do offer a caution that if you do feel like you have no doubts, sharing that with another person is not necessarily a strength. And by the same token, having doubts and questions and being honest in your doubts and questions with another person can be a strength. It shows vulnerability and wins over their trust and says to them, this person is interested in dialogue and now I wanna hear what they have to say. The third point is that doubting allows for the ministry of the wounded healer. Now this is pretty, I think, pretty central to the entire Christian story that just as Christ healed us through his wounds, um, so as we experience our own wounds and suffering, those wounds, can become the grounds for us to ministering to others. So imagine, for example, a family that is going through the loss of a, a child. A child passed away in the family. People come and knock on their door and they say, you know, I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. What can you say? Nothing, of course. There's nothing you can say to make that better. But someone then comes to the door and knocks and says, I'm so sorry for your loss. I lost my child as well. The second that that person says that, they establish a common ground of shared experience with this grieving family. And now they can be welcomed into this grieving family and share their story and journey with the pain of this family. And that becomes the catalyst for the understanding of the wounded healer. Though we can bring healing to others through the wounds through which we ourselves uh, continue to strive to, to struggle with. Like Paul with his thorn in the flesh that he talks about in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Um, we can have thorns in the flesh and they can become part of our story of God's grace flowing through us to other people. And that includes doubts and questions. When you have doubts and questions as a Christian, those can be part of your own journey as a wounded healer, reaching out to others and helping them with their own struggles. And the last thing I think I'll say on this point, uh, the fourth one, the fourth point I wanna make is that one can be certain for ignoble reasons. Um, so for example, what I mean by that there are noble reasons and there are ignoble reasons. There are virtuous reasons and there are non-virtuous or vice-based reasons for lacking or having certainty. Um, and I, I will, let me, let me um, frame this by saying it does go both ways. So a person can doubt, have doubts for ignoble reasons. Let's say for example, that you have uh, Gideon still doubting and God keeps providing him with, with further evidence of what God is calling him to do. And so right, he's setting out the fleece, uh, Lord, give me a sign, um, make the ground dry, the fleece wet, make the ground wet, the fleece dry. And Gideon keeps testing God. And there comes a point where Gideon's doubting becomes irrational, unreasonable, um, and a uh, potentially a barrier to him being used fully by God. And that can happen to each one of us, right? Think about Peter <clears throat> when he's already seen Jesus performing miracles and he's not willing to get out of the boat and trust him. And Jesus says, ye of little faith, because the thing is that Jesus had already been performing these miracles. And in fact, in that very moment was walking on the water, which was already adequate evidence that he would be able, that he would be able to keep Peter walking on the water as well. And so when Peter sinks, that is an example of an ignoble doubting or you know, a, a, a doubting that should not be commended or um, is, is lacking in epistemic virtue. But it goes the same way in the other direction. And this is something that James White apparently doesn't seem to get, which is that you can be certain for ignoble reasons, just as you can doubt for ignoble reasons. For example, 
uh, you can be indoctrinated into a particular worldview and you can be indoctrinated into Christianity and you may never have paused to think through some of the difficulties of your faith and you've never exposed yourself to alternate viewpoints. You've never seriously questioned, questioned, questioned and challenged the things that you believe. You've never treated the Muslim or the atheist or the naturalist or the Jew or anybody else as a serious partner in dialogue, trying to understand their position and understanding why they don't hold your position. And you're certain in your beliefs, but that certainty is carried along by your lack of epistemic virtue because you have never seriously engaged with other people and listened to their ideas. And you've never seriously introspected and looked at the challenges to Christianity of which there are many. Um, in that case, you are certain, yes, and James White would think, yes, you are a good candidate for being an apologist because you're certain. But I would say that your certainty is one that is ignoble and in fact becomes a vice because you lack the very virtues that one would want to see and one would expect to see in a good Christian apologist. So uh, to sum up again, James White just dismisses Mike Licona's ministry, I think says, well, I probably shouldn't be doing apologetics. By doing that, he ignores both his character and content of his apologetics. And James White thereby, by elevating certainty, he has an over-realized eschatology. Um, he endorses a view certainty that can potentially close down conversation and inhibit productive apologetic exchanges. He fails to recognize the central value of the wounded healer, whether it be healing of physical suffering, emotional suffering, or the cognitive suffering of doubts. And he fails to recognize that one can be certain for ignoble reasons. And thus certainty in and of itself does not make you a fitting candidate for being an apologist. Neither does the lack of certainty or the presence of questions and doubts within your faith um, become an ex exclusionary reason for you not to become an apologetic apologist, far from it indeed. If anything, your very presence of questions and doubts could become the very strength under which you do apologetics and by which you, in your apologetic ministry, do become a wounded healer others.